Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. We are a year-round talk series bringing you the best creative voices across film, television, and theater. And I'm so, so delighted to be joined today by the wonderful Julia Hart and Jordan Horowitz to talk about their movie, I'm Your Woman. And I wanted to start by asking you a, about the script writing process since you wrote this together um, and just what the unique aspects of this particular script were, because one of the things that's so striking about the tone and the pacing is, is that there's actually a lot of kind of internal quietness to the moments and particularly to the character of Jean and, and a lot of moments that are unsaid. And I was interested in how that creates a slightly different challenge in terms of the writing process and crafting out what those scenes are gonna look like on the page. It's actually like, I. it's funny because my favorite, my favorite thing to do is write dialogue. Mm -hmm. And early on in our writing partnership, I wrote most of the dialogue and you wrote most of the action. And then as time yeah. has gone on, it's really blended together. And now we just kind of both write everything. Yeah, yeah we would break story together and then mm -hmm. at the actual writing stage. It would. But I think in a script like this, where there was so much that was said through action, it was a different process mm -hmm. because a lot of that is written out on the page. But, you know, we prefer to, when, when we're describing when we're describing what someone is feeling without when they're not speaking, mm -hmm. it's really through action. Like mm -hmm. we won't say she feels sad. We'll say, you know, she looks down, brushes back her hair, takes a breath mm -hmm. or like her eyes, you know, dart all over the room and she shakes her head, you know, and really let the actors imbue cause it's acting, right? It's mm -hmm. like, what can we express through action? And so we really like when it is about an internal moment, describing what we're seeing mm -hmm. and letting the actor imbue what we're seeing with that feeling. Yeah, we, we just try to do as little like editorializing mm -hmm. as possible. And there's always a, a pass at one point where we're like, or <laughs> I'm, I'm sure the one who just gets very aggressive about like, this is too much editorializing. <laughs> we have to cut this and that and the other thing, just get it out. Um, so yeah. That definitely, I mean, that's true of all of our scripts, but with this one in particular, just given there is so much quietness, um, as mm -hmm. you said, uh, it, it definitely had more of that. And there was also a lot of the baby stuff that was written in there that wound up being what it was because of the baby. But. Well, and I, I was going to, I was going to say something about what you were saying before you said the thing about the baby and I'm still going to say it, okay. which is so, like an actor can't play sad. You can't say to yeah. an actor, give me sad. And you can't, or you shouldn't. I mean, because like, what are, you, what, the, what are you supposed to do with that? You know, and you don't want to write on the page like she's sad. It's so much more interesting because we don't know that someone is feeling sad unless we see the physicality of that. You know, if someone's eyes get glassy or their breath slows down or, or they can't look you in the eye, you know? So it's so much more interesting from an acting perspective and a writing perspective to explore what sadness looks like than just telling someone to be sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one of the things that's so interesting with the with the central character of Jean, Rachel Brosnahan's character, is also how much of her isn't on the page and how much of her life we never see. It exists in such a microcosm in a very short space of time. And I know that obviously you had a lot of conversations once you were filming and working with Rachel about the character's backstory. But even at the beginning, when you were scripting it out, how kind of in depth and how far back do you like to go with your characters beyond what you're putting on the page for them? I mean, we think about it a lot and we brainstorm a lot, like in the outlining process. There's a lot of like actual writing down outlining, but there's also a lot of talking about the history in the past. Um, but really as far as the actual writing process goes, it's just like, this is the moment, you know? And then you go forward from there. But I think it's always important to know what's going on outside of the page, mm -hmm. even if you don't ever actually write it down well, one thing we did do with this particular story that we found really helpful was um because in many ways there's the like there's the the original version of a of, a, of what is a male dominated crime drama that's happening somewhere else we wrote what the the sort of beats were of that story um and where they would intersect with the beats of the story we were telling so we we knew what was going on behind the scenes from a from a pure like story and action place, and that helped mm -hmm. to to drive some of her behaviors and also the situation she then found herself in. And then we 
we, we knew that and then said, we're going to stay really true to her perspective. So what she knows about the things that we as storytellers know, like audiences can only know what she knows. So that, that was kind of, that was the, the tricky balance of, of, of writing this particular screenplay um, was finding those, those moments of intersection, but always wanting to keep tension and, and narrative momentum pushing forward. Yeah. And I also wanted to talk a little bit about Rachel coming on board on this project as a producer as well. And I know that she's talked extensively about how it was actually a really valuable tool to her as an actor to be there in the early stages, to be there for script conversations, to know the locations when she walked on to set. Um, but was interested, you know, from your perspective, what she brought to the table and also particularly your collaborative relationship with her, Jordan, because one of the other things that she's mentioned is how you really created a space for her to have the ability to grow and to also learn as a producer are coming into a role like this for one of the first times. It was um, awesome having her on as a producer. Um, I'm definitely, when her, when she first engaged with it, you know, we went to her as an actress. Mm -hmm. Her manager's been a friend of mine for a really long time. So she came on, and uh, Julia can speak to that. I'm sure we'll talk about it at some point. But um, when she came on first as an actress, you know, very quickly, um, we started having the conversation about how she, you know, has a production company and she's you know just starting the company and is really looking to do work as a producer and actually be a real producer um and the conversation that I had with uh with her manager and then ultimately with her it was really clear to me that she wanted to do the work of a producer which is um which is the most important first step uh in terms of when I have a producing partner um but then what was really amazing about her is not only did she do the work but she brought a really um, surprising perspective that I hadn't anticipated her bringing. First of all, as a woman, it's always nice to have um, have a different perspective from the producer uh, from the producing angle. But then also, she would always think in terms of her character. For example, she would come with us on uh, location scouts uh, early, which actors you know usually don't do that. But when she was coming with us on these scouts, she would be thinking from the point of view of her character and how she's living in those spaces. Um, you know, when we're going, Julia is doing some of that as a director, as a producer, I'm saying, well, is this feasible for production? But she'd be thinking about it, not, not just from a production point of view, but from a character place. And then she carried that same um, perspective through all of the various stages of producing. Um, in the edit, she was always talking about um, storytelling from the point of view of her character, not from the point of view of Rachel Brosnahan performing this character, but from the point of view of the character itself. And how are we how is this edit working um, from that angle? And I, I just found that perspective to be incredibly invaluable. And I, I think you'd say the same thing. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like it was invaluable for her as an actor and it was invaluable for us as directors, as writers, as producer. Um, and she totally spoiled us because now I feel like I only want to have the actors be a producer, but when they're not involved everybody now, like, yeah. would be as good as, as, as her at it because like people often ask me like, oh, like, are you going to produce a journal? I'm like, no, I would be a terrible producer. Are you kidding me? <laughs> like, it's not, it's not an easy, mm -hmm. it's not an easy job. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of the times people take that title and then don't really do the job mm -hmm. because there's not a lot of oversight. Like there is for the WGA and there is for the DGA. Um, and so I really appreciated and respected, but also got totally spoiled by what a good producer she was. But, you know, producers do have the PGA mark and Rachel and I both have a PGA mark on this movie and, you know, she- And we both than... deserve it. Exactly. Yeah. And then Julia, I also wanted to talk a little bit about the camera choices that you make throughout the film, because it's so stunning the way that you kind of select a lot of very specific camera choices that feel like they're intimately inviting us into just kind of observing mm -hmm. and following the character of Jean, even the way that you very frequently have the camera actually right behind her head as she's walking into a new space so that we don't see anything before she experiences it. Um, and just how, you know, really telling the story so specifically from her character's perspective informed so many of those choices and how you kind of mapped that out. Thank you, because that is, you know, that was something that was incredibly important to us. So Bryce Fortner, our DP, this is our second film together. He also mm -hmm. shot our Disney movie, Stargirl. Um, one of the reasons that I wanted to work with him and love working with him is because story is as important to him as light and like same. <laughs> um, I don't think that one should ever take a priority over the other. I think that the camera is such an important storytelling tool, mm -hmm. especially when you are telling a story from 
every frame of the movie is from her perspective. And so how, how do you achieve that in a way that is both intimate, authentic, and cinematic at the same time? And it was really fun to figure it out. We shot list the entire film in prep. It's really important to me to have everything figured out so that on the day we can experiment and explore knowing we have that foundation and that safety net underneath us. And we also had the added bonus on this film of having these movies that we were paying homage to these seventies crime dramas. So like, how can we simultaneously keep this within Jean's perspective, but also explore the world of those films through, through her perspective, you know? And how can we film a seventies car chase but instead of it just being about the spectacle and might I say danger that a lot of those car chases in the seventies were filmed with that you cannot and should not <laughs> do anymore. Yeah. But how, you know, how can we, how can we keep the excitement and the scale of those car chases while also being safe? Um, but be, but also being in this intimate emotional experience of this one woman within that car case. And so it was a really great guiding principle for us to always, always be thinking about those movies. And we really also tried to avoid a lot of the like, like we didn't, we, we tried not to do too much with VFX that they wouldn't have had the ability to do in the seventies. We really tried to stay authentic to how those movies looked as much as possible in, in terms of what camera tools they used. Um, but also again, like really keeping it keeping it Jean's story and keeping the camera with her. Yeah, and I also <laughs> wanted to ask very specifically about the nightclub scene because it's so, so meticulously detailed in, in how you've put it together from the costume detail, the hair and makeup, the location that you have. And again, just the way that you kind of have the camera go into the action and then just pull back and we know that something's happening in the room. And you, re like, I thought that was such an interesting choice and wanted to ask how you landed on the decision to really just leave it within the audience's imagination and actually never show any of that that's going on and why it wasn't necessary either. Well, again, I think it was just that our guy, our guiding principle was mm -hmm. we're with Jean, yeah. you know, it, it, like when in doubt, just like stick with Jean's perspective. And so we all know what's happening off camera. We've seen it in so many movies. We've seen that mm -hmm. shootout. We've seen that chaos. We've seen that violence. We've seen that destruction. What I hadn't seen was like, show me what the, the terror of not knowing what's happening out there looks like and feels like. And so again, it was it was a challenge because we had it all going on. Like there are 300 background actors and stunt performers working together to create that chaos and create that feeling so that, you know, when the camera pans from Jean, it's all there. And so it was quite a challenge navigating that, that big scope with, again, the intimate experience Jean was having and our DP Bryce was operating through that sequence. When too. she goes into the when club. She, yeah, yeah. When she, when she opens the door and goes, you know, Mm -hmm. into the chaos and it was cool too because we had to build a lot of that was actually a set some of it's a location and some of it's a set and um having to build part of it actually provided us with the ability to you know be in that phone booth with gene which we might not have been able to do if we had been on a practical location so it's it's fun too when the challenge of having to create a space actually makes the moment in the film stronger. Also would have been tough to find a 70s phone in, <laughs> in perfect working order. It's true, yeah. true. I was also really intrigued by a lot of the dialogue cho choices that you make for the character of Jean specifically as well, because I thought it was so interesting in that she speaks in questions so frequently throughout. She doesn't very often kind of come with a statement. She's very much trying to navigate her situation, her scenario, figure out what's going on. And so it's a lot of questions that introduce us and, and was just kind of curious about where that specific choice came from initially and, and how that really carries throughout the entire film. So, you know, Jean, Jean comes, and I don't want to give too much away, but mm -hmm. for people who haven't seen it, but you know, Jean comes to the movie already with post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Because of some events that we learn about later that have already happened in her past. And then she is thrust into a new trauma when she has to go on the run with her baby because of her husband's crimes and something that happens to the traumatized brain is it's like if you think about the filing cabinet of your mind and your life and everything's kind of filed in different places and different events and different sequences when the brain is traumatized that filing cabinet gets like thrown up into the air and all the files get mixed up and so Rachel and I talked a lot about that scientific research of, of, of what trauma actually does to the brain 
And so the questions came from trying to sort, you know, she suddenly finds out her life isn't at all what she thought it was. And so she spends so much of the movie trying to sort through where, where, where this goes and when this happened and what was actually happening when I thought something else was happening. And it's funny because I think questions can come across in some ways as a sign of weakness, like you don't know, but it's actually her trying to take control again of her life by getting those answers. And eventually just being like, you're not going to give me the answers. I'm going to go get them myself. So. And make my own and, and, and take agency. Ultimately, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. like re reclaim those things yeah. for myself. Yeah, and I also wanted to ask a little bit about the development of the character Terry, who's played by Marcia Stephanie Blake, and and the way that her and her the character of Terry and Jean are very much juxtapositions of each other. But what's so fascinating is they've had so many shared life experiences, mm -hmm. but they've both kind of approached it and dealt with it in very different ways. And so I was interested in even just in the early stages in mapping out those two characters, how you really saw them as a slight antithesis to each other. Um, absolutely. I think there's something fascinating about two women who have, again, without giving too much away, shared so much in such different ways. And I loved Terry being a foil to Jean in terms of how she is a wife, in terms of how she is a woman, in terms of how she is a mother, and the ways in which Jean can observe her and learn from her versus the men we've seen Jean being handled by throughout the first half of the film. Um, but also in the development process, Terry and Cal were always black characters. And so something else that was really important to us to explore was not only the differences in their experiences because they're just different women, but mm -hmm. the differences in their experience because Jean is a white woman and Terry is a black woman. And Jean's, again, because we're always in Jean's perspective, her, the, the dawning of her white privilege on her and you know this white mm -hmm. suburban bubble that we find her in at the beginning of the film and then what she learns about what the world is really like through the characters of uh, Cal and Terry. Mm -hmm. And you also, you know, through the vehicle of Cal and Terry, you have a lot of it, moments which are genuine experiences as black characters in 1970s America, but you do it in such a nuanced way. You know, you don't make a, massive dramatic moment out of when they get pulled over by the cop in the car, but you know that there's a sense of drama, there's a sense of tension within it just in the way that it's played out. Was it always important to you to have that as a thread throughout the film, but to really just make it part of what everyday life is? Absolutely, and I appreciate you noticing that, that, you know, the, the subtlety of those themes I find to be more powerful when I'm watching something because it feels more realistic. You know, mm -hmm. people, people in those situations aren't talking about race. They are living their race. Yeah. You know, Cal as a black man is living being a black man. Jean as a white woman is living being a white woman. They're not gonna talk about it. They're just, that's their lived in experience. And certainly, more, you know, it, now we are definitely talking about it more in any given situation in 2020, but certainly in the 1970s, like there's no way they would have been having that conversation in, in an explicit way. Yeah. On a separate note, I wanted to ask about some of some of the baby logistics and because you were mentioning <laughs> earlier how there were actually beats with that that you had written into the script that then obviously didn't work because you can't control babies and what they do. But also the way in which there were some unexpected moments, you know, having the baby actually suddenly fall asleep on set and having that really change the energy in a scene and need to keep it very quiet to make sure that you're not waking the kid up so, because that's going to completely change everything that's happening in that moment as you're filming. So I wanted to ask a little bit about, you know, what were those moments that you were hoping for at the beginning within the script that you weren't able to achieve, but some of the moments like when they fall asleep and it changes the energy of a scene that kind of beautifully came out of it? Well, it's, it's funny because, you know, we have, we have two little kids yeah. and yeah. when we were writing it, we were already parents. So like, and even we, like, you know, we wrote those dream baby beats into the script, but knew full well, like, you know, we'll see what we'll happens. See what happens. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there was anything explicitly that we wanted from the baby that we didn't get. Um, I'm trying to remember, maybe you can speak to that, but there was certainly a lot that we weren't anticipating that the baby mm -hmm. delivered on. Um, you know, when you have a baby showing up to set, or it was twins, um, Justin and Jameson, you know, when they would show, they were amazing. Their mother was amazing. Um, that collaboration with Julia and, and Caitlin, their mother and, and, and the two kids was 
essential. And we knew from very, very early on in the process that we, we would need to find the right relationships and the right babies in order to make the movie work. So that was one of the first things we did when we got to Pittsburgh. So we had to cast them locally in Pittsburgh was hold baby auditions. It was very <laughs> clear when they came in that they were, they, <laughs> they were the, the ones. <laughs> um, they were incredible. Um, from like first day we met them, from the first pictures we saw of them. And then um, they're just, they're, they're living their lives. They don't know that they're on a set. They just, this is what their life is today. <laughs> um, and um, they were amazing. And, you know, early on, we shot a lot of the movie, uh, not in like page to page sequence, but mm -hmm. chronological ish sequence for the most part. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing to see them change over the course of the movie and begin to understand what was going on around them. Cause you know, they were six months old when we started shooting and they were about eight, eight, eight and a half months old when we finished. Um, and that's a world of difference. Yeah. I, Know, which is why we children which is why, why we, we did tried that to shoot as much and sequence but it happened so gradually over the course of the movie you don't notice it as a as a viewer but in in i don't think but at well i think if you go if you if you were to look at the first yes. frame of them and then the first the first day they shot is the first time we see them in the movie and the last day they shot is the last time we see them in the movie and like you really like if you were to look at those screen grabs next to like, each other, Whoa. it's like wow. Yeah. But I think because it happens in sequence, it it just yeah, kind of like gradually natural. happens over the course of the movie. But that was something that was really important to us. But yeah, Julia. I mean, listen. I, I I've said many times. I don't think that anyone other than a woman and a mother could have made this movie. Um, directing Rachel, and not only directing Rachel, but directing Rachel as a new mother and having her do everything she does with a baby. Um, and Julia's relationship with the baby's mothers and with the babies themselves, and also Rachel's relationship with the babies. She's unbelievably good with children. Um, that really uh, made the heart and soul yeah, of the movie. Because you're, you're dealing, like, these are Caitlin's babies. Right. Like, you're dealing with someone and their babies. Yeah. And, like, the trust that I, you know, we spent a lot of time in the rehearsal process just hanging out together, having her get to know me, having her get to know Rachel, having the babies get to know, babies get to know Rachel. Like, that was essential to the process, as Jordan said, because, you know, I would never have put those babies in harm's way, and she knew that. Right. And yeah. I had to earn her knowing that. Yeah. So it, it allowed Rachel and I to really be with those babies because their mom trusted us and because they trusted yeah, us. For like sure. Babies know when things are. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. And uh, there is one moment in particular that I do think about a lot because it was scripted. And again, I don't want to give too much away, but there's a scene where Rachel goes into a closet. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And um, with the baby. And it wasn't scripted that they were asleep. They were supposed to actually wake up um, before she got to the closet and she was supposed to try to be quieting them but they just happened to fall asleep on the day. And so we just went with it. And it's like one of my favorite moments of the babies in the movie, because instead of her trying to quiet a baby, she's trying to keep a baby asleep, which has its own type of drama and tension. And there's like this moment where the baby's head just kind of falls back and Rachel's just like, please stay asleep, please stay asleep. And so them not necessarily doing what was scripted often created these like new magical versions that were even better than like what we had. The sound of the baby breathing in that moment. Yeah. yeah. So, and that's the baby's breathing the baby when it's breathing. sleeping. Yeah. That being said, getting a baby to sleep. <laughs> when on, you want it when to. When you want it to sleep. It never happens. Is very, very, very difficult. We, we developed this, like this way of doing it where we would take, a, we would schedule the shot of the baby sleeping for after lunch. Um, and we would break the babies. We would shoot up until lunch. And then the baby and the ba whichever baby was more tired, which the mother <laughs> would tell us, would be in their costume. Um, and they would be put to sleep on the live set in their costume mm -hmm. with their mother. And then we would very, very <sighs> quietly, like a small group of people would very quietly come back early a little bit from lunch. And we would just grab the shot of the baby sleeping, like uh, whoever it was, just the small camera crew, a sound person, Julia Rachel. and Rachel would just quietly come back early from lunch, keep the baby asleep because they'd fallen asleep on the quiet set over the course of lunch. And then we would grab that shot and then hardest, we would all cheer very quietly. Yeah. Hardest, <laughs> we did that. Hardest shots it's amazing. Yeah. Shot. They look like the easiest thing in the world. Baby sleep all the time. It's just the baby sleeping. You don't think about the fact that it needs to be in its costume, mm -hmm. sleeping on the set, like the period yeah. crib on the set, you know. The hardest one was the one where, she, where the baby's sleeping in Rachel's they arms in the diner. <laughs> that one was really yeah. hard though. But yeah, it's, and they're important. Like they're, yeah. they're important moments and they are, you think it's like the yeah. easiest thing in the world. And it's like, 
No, it's actually yeah. harder than shooting a car chase. I guess, the, you know, she puts the sock on the baby and then order. there's a lot of sleeping babies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go back and look for all the sleeping baby moments. Again. Yeah, I think there's two, there's two or three. Yeah. yeah. I also thought it was such an interesting choice that at the very be very beginning of the film, when Eddie first arrives with, with the baby for Jean, that at no point is there really much of a conversation about where did the baby come from? Where did you get it? Who's its mother? And then equally throughout the film, it doesn't necessarily have that tension of feeling like she's looking over her shoulder, feeling that someone's coming and looking for the baby. You know, even when she's pulled over by the cop, that's not her concern. The fact that she feels very comfortable taking the kid to a public place like a diner and I was, it was interested if that was always a very clear choice from the get-go that those were going to be part of the plot elements of this child coming into her life. Well, the, the way in which the baby comes into her life was also inspired by Michael Mann's Thief. Mm -hmm. um, if you haven't seen it, anyone who's watching, it's an amazing film and you should definitely watch it. Um, and uh, the baby comes into her life in that film in a very similar way. So that was that was very much an inspiration for that in this film. And it's funny because we just, we just made this decision that she believed, of all the things Eddie had lied to her about, yeah. she believed that. Yeah. And there's a moment later on in the film where maybe she doesn't believe it, but I think she spends most of the film believing that the story that she ultimately tells about where the baby came from is the truth. And it's not until later that she starts to maybe question if that was also a lie, just like everything else. So I think she doesn't have, for all the anxiety and fear she has in the first yeah. half of the film, that's not one of them. Yeah. I also, you know, in terms of, of both of your roles, in terms of directing and producing, they're both jobs where there's such a meticulous amount of planning, but as you obviously know, there's always something that changes on the day. There's always kind of shifts to all the plans that you've made. But I was interested for both of you, whether there were kind of unexpected moments of discovery or things that ended up happening as part of the film that you hadn't necessarily set out as part of the process, but came into play through those moments as you were shooting the film. I mean, just the baby every day. <laughs> Like every day, you know, I, I know we said there's only like one moment we could think of off the top of our heads that really changed, but there were a lot of things that um, ended up being different about what they what they did and what they brought. And just the idea of having, it's like you, you, you plan everything meticulously, you rehearse, you shot list, like you have everything prepared on the day. I always visit the set, the, the future set earlier while we're shooting something else in case I have any notes. Um, you know, you do all of that work and then you put a live living baby in the middle of all of that planning. And it's like, he just took over, you know, whatever was, whatever was happening that day was what with him was what was going to be the energy and, and the effect. So it's like no big story point changed because of him, but because he was alive and just living his life in every scene of the movie, just the energy of everything always felt new and alive in a way that it doesn't always when you're shooting a movie yeah there was a spontaneity yeah that was always present anytime that they and just an urgency set. you know yeah. just like a like he like what he needed always came first yeah and that would always be something different every day yeah. And with the fact that you both have such an immense amount of incredible experience within the industry, but every single project brings new challenges and, and is a very different beast in of its own way. What for each of you were the things that you really felt were the skills that you got to kind of evolve and enhance and, and develop from working on this project and what you really learned from it? Oh, you're gonna say that? No, oh. that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, I, I love just always making different movies. And so I think for me, I've had the privilege of learning new stuff on every movie, you know, like my first movie was a tiny character piece. My second movie had superpowers and visual effects that came along with that. My third movie was a musical and so had musical numbers. And then this was a crime drama. So had car chases and shootouts. So I've really, I feel like I've really gotten to learn something new, a new skill set on every movie that I've made, which is part of what I find so fun about making movies that you can't, you, you know, sure, if it's interesting to you to just like keep setting scenes in living rooms between two characters and different people in different houses, like that's cool. But I, and I love a lot of movies that do that. But for me, it's like, I got to learn how to direct a car chase. I got to learn how to direct a big shootout. I got to learn how to direct a baby, you know, and how do you have a baby be the second lead of a movie? 
Um, and uh, so, so for me, it's always, it's, it's like part of what we find interesting about telling stories is what we can learn that's new and different. So like, I, I feel that way every time. And I think that's like one of the best things about making movies. Mm -hmm. I, I echo that. I think for me on this movie, I definitely learned, and I think this has to do with the, with the baby and Julia and Rachel's relationship with the baby. I definitely had to um, just learn to listen more. Um, and I think I became a better listener on this movie um, because, you know, there are times when I, as the producer, feel like, okay, I know how to get this done. I'm just going to go ahead and do it. There were certain things with, with the baby and with the, uh, again, Julia's relationship to them, to Rachel, Rachel's relationship to them, with the mother that just, I, I was, I intentionally, you know, I, I had a relationship with all of them, but that wasn't my primary focus. Mm -hmm. And there were so many times that just had to be very deferential to that. And that was really important. Um, I also never shot a, I've done big set pieces, but I'd never done a, a car chase. And that was fun working with um, the, you know, doing, working with a, with a rough and arm and, and with our, our stunt coordinator on that. I hadn't done that in a movie and that, it's that really was really fun. fun for, <laughs> it's awesome. for, and I, you know, so there's fun. only so many spots in the car um, and I got to ride in the car once or twice, uh, which was really fun. I got to ride the car. You got to ride the car every, every time. time but, but I always do, because I'm the director. But yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> it was fun. I, I'd never, I'd never shot just that, that particular kind of set before. And that was really fun to do. Yeah, well, it's, it's such a fantastic film. I've watched it twice already and I can't wait to watch it again when it comes out on Amazon Prime. And thank you so thank much you. for diving into talking with us today. Of thank course, you this was so great. Much. Thank this you. This was awesome. Thank you, Mara.